Iowa City Foreign Relations Council hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since 1983 when we were founded, and that was the same year that Fraggle Rock debuted on HBO as its first children's show. Before we begin uh, today's talk, I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, all for their financial support. I want to thank also today's special sponsors, Karen and Wally Chapel, and Midwest One Bank. I would also like to uh, thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4, or 118-2, and also for the UI Library's digital archives. It is my pleasure to introduce Roz Frank. Dr. Rosalind Frank obtained her BA, MA, and PhD from the University of Iowa. She has taught in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Iowa, and is currently a professor emeritus. Her research specializes in Basque studies, cognitive linguistics, European ethnography, ethnomathematics, ethno and archaeoastronomy, informational technologies and orality, ego criticism, Spanish civilization and culture, and Spanish women writers. Wow. <laughs> Her knowledge of languages is extensive, being fluent in English, Spanish, and Eoscara, the Basque language. She also has reading ability in French, German, Italian, Catalan, Portuguese, and Russian. Her research, facilitated by having learned Eoscara, led to a truly remarkable, remarkable discovery, namely that the Basques used to believe they descended from bears, an indigenous belief system that appears to have been shared by other Europeans. Today, Rosalind Frank will be sharing her experiences in the Basque Country, where for the past 40 years, she has carried out fieldwork and related programs. So please join me in welcoming Roz Frank. There are three things most people know about the Basque Country. The, the Basque language, uh, called Euskera, is an isolate, unrelated to any other in the world. Its origins are a mystery although it's classed as pre-Indo-European. Basques, the Basques are usually viewed as outsiders, culturally and linguistically speaking. There was also an armed movement for Basque independence called ETA, Euskade Tayaskata Suna, uh, and the, its name uh, is often translated as Basque homeland and liberty. It was founded in 1959, during the Franco regime. It evolved from a group promoting traditional Basque values, culture, and language to a paramilitary group. Over 40 years later, in 2011, the, there was a permanent ceasefire declared, which is still in force. When I first went to the Basque country over 40 years ago, those were pretty much the only things I knew then. But I also went there with a question in my mind. Why was it that during, during all the years that I worked on my master's and went on to finish my PhD in Spanish and Portuguese, none of my professors had ever talked about the Basque language or the culture attached to it? For me, I, it's, I sensed a vacuum, an unconscious or perhaps deliberate suppression of information about the Basque region. And at the same time, I was intrigued there was an air of mystery about the place. So I decided I wanted to find out for myself what might be hiding in that language that no one ever bothered to t mention, as well as in the beliefs of the people that uh, spoke it. I arrived in 1974, one year before Franco died. 
and for the following 10 years, I went over to Spain each summer, accompanying a group of students from the University of Iowa who were learning Spanish. During that decade, we took students to the town of Burgos, just south of the Basque region, and one of the most pro-Franco, anti-Basque parts of Spain at that time. This was also the location where the, the army training grounds were, and conscripts from the Basque country had to go there to do their military service. That experience, <clears throat> that experience was one that uh, included uh, the, rec the, the recruits from the Basque country in the company of other recruits uh, having to shout, Muerte a los Bascos, death to the Basque in practice sessions each time the mil their military superiors ordered them to attack with guns raised. So what exactly is the Basque country? In English, we use the term Basque country as if it were unproblematic. However, it has many different meanings, depending on one's perspective. From the point of view of a Basque speaker, we are talking about an entity called Euskal Herria, that expression translates roughly as Basque-speaking people and consists of the Saspiak, but a unity of seven subunits. Even though Basque speakers view the seven units on this map as representing Euskal Herria, the map also sends a political message with respect to Basque identity. For example, in the recent past, attempts were made to ban the use of this map in weather reports on Basque television. So even a map like this one can be subject to controversy. Also, from the point of view of political organization, the visual unity portrayed on this map rapidly breaks down into separate administrative units. These are situated inside Spain and France. There are three basic divisions. The Basque Autonomous com Community, consisting of Biscaya, Gipuzkoa, and Araba, Nafarro Agaraya, the Foro Community of Navarre, and Iparralde, the Northern Basque Country, consisting of Lapurde, Nafarroa Beereira, and Suberoa, on the French side of the political border. Now, to give you an idea of the size and relative population, <clears throat> the total geographical extent of Euskal Herria is 90 miles by 90 miles. Iowa has 56,000 square miles. The Basque Country has 7,000. You can put eight of them inside Iowa. Okay, total population, 3 million. Total population of Basque speakers, approximately 750,000. The per percentage of Basque speakers to non-Basque speakers is one in four. As noted, only 25% of the overall population of Euskal Herria are Basque speakers, Euskal Lunac. They are concentrated in small villages located in the relatively mountainous parts of the north, where there is a much smaller percentage of Basque speakers, while there is a much smaller percentage of Basque speakers in the plains to the south. This fact can be appreciated in the map to the right. In 2015, for the first time since the end of the Franco regime, a pro-Basque nationalist party took control of the government of, Co of Navarre, at the red part. Before 2015, all previous governments had been run by political parties whose identification was with Madrid, and most definitely were against the promotion of the Basque language and culture. In 2015, Ushuay Barcos, a woman who speaks fluent Basque, became president of Navarre and the election results showed a significant increase in pro-Basque sentiment in the region. This shift in, a, in political and linguistic allegiances did not go unnoticed in Madrid, as we will see a bit later in this presentation, namely when we discuss the case of Alchascua, which is currently making headlines all across Spain and resonating even in the European Union. We'll revisit this slide shortly. But before we do, we need to go back in time. The name Guernica is best known by those residing outside the Basque region as the scene of the April 26, 1937 bombing of this town, the town of Guernica, 
one of the first aerial bombardments of, by Nazi Germany's Luftwaffe, which acted in support of Generalissimo Francisco Franco. As is well known, the bombing inspired the above commemorative painting by Pablo Picasso. The date chosen, according to some quite deliberately, for the bombardment was a Monday, a market day. This ensured that the crowds of people, not only from Guernica itself, but also from nearby villages, would be out and about in the streets. Indeed, the normal population of 77,000 regulars swelled to 10,000 on market days. For almost four hours, bombs rained down on Guernica in an experiment for blitzkrieg tactics, the bombing and aerial machine gun strafing of civilians that a few years later, in the course of World War II, would be carried out over other European cities. In short, the village of Guernica was razed to the ground by German aircraft in a deliberate act meant to deliver a message to the vast people a message that they have never forgotten. <clears throat> Unfortunately, today, the message sent by Franco when he chose this site for aerial bombardment is lost on those outside of the Basque country. But it was far more than the, a simple disruption of lives and buildings. This is because Guernica has be, had been, and in many senses is still today, the symbolic heart, the spiritual capital of the Basque country. For centuries, it had been the location where under a sacred oak tree, open air batsarrak assemblies were conducted in an early form of democracy practiced. Here are some scenes from the destruction of Guernica. And a view of the town afterwards. Franco and the Falanges, aided by military assets of Mussolini and Hitler, came to power in 1939. And at that point, for the rest of the world, the Spanish war, Civil War was over. However, the Franco regime ushered in decades of cultural, linguistic, and political hardships for the Basque people, whose suffering and struggles against this oppression would continue for some 40 years. Only in 1978 would major reforms come into being. During much of that 40-year period, the Basque language was outlawed. Lord, writing in Basque or speaking it at school or in public was severely punished. Parents were prohibited from giving their children first names in Basque. Even possessing a book written in Basque was extremely dangerous. Here we'll look at a very brief anecdote about a kucha, a trunk. I was told this anecdote by a woman who grew up under Franca in a Basque-speaking family in what was a remote farmstead. Each year at Christmas time, her mother gathered the children around, took out a key and unlocked the kucha, like the one in the photograph, to show the children what was carefully hidden at the bottom under all the household linens. She would take out from the very, very bottom a package wrapped under some, with some cloth, open the package, and there was a, a children's book that had been published around 1930, which had very colorful pictures in it. It was a book for, to teach children who knew Basque how to read and write in Basque. She would let the children touch the book, look at the book, look at the pictures in the book, and then she would tell them, see, here's proof the Basque language can be written. Then she would take the book, wrap it up, and hide it again in the bottom of the trunk. In many Basque-speaking families, instead of capitulation and acceptance of Spanish identity, the result was increased defiance, <clears throat> albeit often silently expressed, yet passed on from one generation to the next. So even though the Basque language and expressions of Basque identity were outlawed, including, of course, any public display of the Icorina, the Basque flag, rather than destroying the sense of identity that Basque had, the oppression only served to consolidate it. And Basque identity had continued to be reinforced by the writings of those leaders who during the Civil War had to go into exile in the United States, Mexico, and Latin America. And it was fostered clandestinely inside Euskal Herria. By the late 1960s, the Franco regime was lessening its grip and clandestine schools were springing up where children were taught to read and write in their language, hidden away in apartments, and gathered around kitchen tables. 
away from the prying eyes of the Spanish civil guards. By 1978, the Basque language, as well as Catalan and Galician, became co-official co languages. At, the same at this point, the Basque began a long process of creating educational opportunities, textbooks, and other vehicles for teaching Euskera in schools. A Basque, the Basque government also began providing funds for literacy classes geared to adults who spoke Basque fluently who could read and write in Spanish, but who had never had the opportunity to learn to read and write in their own language. These efforts continue to, uh, to this day. Indeed, it's a constant struggle waged by Basque speakers to defend their language and promote it, its use in all settings. Most Americans are well aware of the running of the bulls, which takes place each July in the town of Pamplona, whose name in Basque is Irunye. What the American public doesn't realize is that this event has been the occasion in which year after year, Baths have, <coughs> have attempted to insert their flag into the festivities, particularly by having it fly from the balcony of the town hall in the opening ceremony. It was not until February 30th, 2017, that the law of sim symbolos, the law of symbols, was revoked by Ushuay Barcos in the Parliament of Navarre. Only then was the Corriña allowed to fly from, the mu dis from municipal town halls, even th though Madrid is still contesting that decision. And here we have the day in which the flag was able to fly legally for the first time. And here's the reaction of the people when the flag came out, was put out on the balcony. Now, television cameras are focused on Pamplona when the running of the bulls take place. This is also an opportunity for, for the bass to talk or show the rest of the world what's bothering them, right? Or what they're proud of. You can see the bass flag there. Uh, and here you'll see the words free, alchasu, ashke. Uh, Alchashu is the name of a town. Ashke means free or freedom in Basque. This is July 2017. We're going to turn now to the case of the conflict in Navarre and the Alchasu 8. As we noted earlier, in 2015, for the first time since the Civil War, a pro Basque coalition came to power in Navarre, reflecting an increased consciousness of Basque identity among the citizenry particularly in the northern part of Navarre. And the people were quite optimistic about the future. The incident that caused the conflict, now with national and international dimensions, took place in a local bar around 5 a.m. in the morning, on the 15th of October, 2016. It was first reported in the local press simply as a bar fight, where three of the four victims ended up with nothing more than a few cuts and bruises, while the fourth suffered kicks and punches and came out with a fractured ankle. In November 2016, things changed radically. Eight young people were arrested and put in a jail near, put in a jail near Madrid, where three of them, Oyan, Joaquin, and Alur, remain today. This is a picture outside of one of the jails, a mock-up. Right? Alchaz was a town of some 7,000 inhabit inhabitants in a mountainous region of the north of Navarre. Traditionally, it's been a stronghold for the Basque language as, and culture, as well as uh, this is a, the same that has been the case in, of many other Basque-speaking localities. The day the incident occurred, the young people had been out drinking, celebrating the town's annual festivities, a bit like homecoming in Iowa City. The incident took place inside and just outside of one of the local bars, the Bar Koshka. It involved young people who by then had been drinking heavily all day and by their own admission were quite drunk. According to the testimony of the two civil guards and their partners who were the object of the alleged attack, the incident also involved a lot of name calling. Overall, the civil guards and their female companions felt outnumbered and intimidated by the actions and verbal attacks by the locals. It's, but it still looked like a bar brawl. Like dozens that like the dozens that occur every weekend in Spain, bar fights in which young civil guards sometimes are found taking part. A month after the event in the bar in Alchasu, 
A Madrid court charged eight young people with a much more serious crime, with a recommended prison sentences totaling 375 years. What had happened was no longer classified as a simple bar fight, fueled by al alcohol, but rather as an act of terrorism and also as a hate crime. In this instance, the specific minority group upon which these alleged acts of hate were committed was redefined by the court as an institution composed of the members of the Civil Guard. For years, tensions have simmered in Al Chasu between the members of the Civil Guard and local residents, especially the young people of the town, who have been adamant about wanting the detachment of some 30 Civil Guards to leave. The conflict, at times covert, at others overt, has manifested itself in demonstrations, public pronouncements, posting banners, distributing flyers, and parading about with guard cardboard mock-ups of the armored vehicles used by the Civil Guards to break up demonstrations, demonstrations mock-ups like the one shown in the photo at, to the right, which these young people are trying to protect. You'll see why. Shortly, the Civil Guard in turn regularly destroys the replicants often violently dismantling them and carting them off, now smashed to pieces on the back of their trailer trucks. <clears throat> All the while, uh, often delivering punishing blows to the humans in attendance at such events. Here you have the scene just before the Civil Guard uh, attack the mock-up. Here is the mock-up being carried off. In 2015, over 3,000 roadblocks run by the Civil Guard were reported in the Basque Country. In Al Chasu, the Civil Guard regular sets up roadblocks, frisking and even insulting those who pass by. <clears throat> they also issue fines for traffic violations, viewed by many as totally bogus. In Al Chasu, people are also fined for carrying banners in demonstrations and taking part in plays aimed at dis denouncing or making fun of the Civil Guard as an institution. And there's probably some name calling there too. Fines are levied too on people for attending demonstrations or even witnessing a demonstration from inside their own homes. Again, this is a practice that's been going on for years and it's intended to cause financial hardship on the local residents and it includes even fining the elected officials of the town. From 2013 to 2014, uh, the total of politically motivated fines levied on the residents of Alchasu amounted to more than 30,000 euros, with individual fines often reaching 600 euros, none of which has been a laughing matter for those involved. The situation result has resulted in residents banding together to help each other out by sharing the financial costs. In sum, in the past, the leveling of these fines has been viewed as a way on the part of the Civil Guard to selectively punish those individuals and families deemed tr troublemakers and to demonstrate who is really in charge. Given that in the past, Yokin, one of the accused, had been associated with demonstrations against the continued presence of the detachment of civil guards in the town, it's not a surprise that prior to the incident, he'd been fined several times, actually four different times. In fact, according to the testimony given in court by Yokin himself, things started inside the bar Koshka when Yokin entered and verbally confronted the off-duty civil guards about the four fines he'd received and the fact that the civil guards were constantly finding the, finding the young people of the town and then showing up in the local bars. Exactly who was involved in what happened in the, ta uh, in the tavern and just outside it is still unclear. What is clear, however, is whatever transpired occurred enveloped in a fog of alcohol. Consequently, there's no doubt that even the recollection of the two civil guards, recollections of the two civil guards have been filtered through the same distorting lens, a fact which might explain the many contradictions in their testimony. The incident is brought, ha, <coughs> was brought to the attention of the Audiencia Nacional Court in Madrid by a group called Covite, which has a long history of anti-Basque sentiment 
They argued that the trial should not take place in a provincial court in Navarre, but rather be moved to Madrid, and that the nature of the charges should be changed. The judge in charge of the proceedings was Carmen Lamela. She agreed and charged the eight young people with several crimes, classifying, classi classifying what happened not as a simple assault, but rather as an act of terrorism and as well as a hate crime. <coughs> in response, the Navarrese government appealed the decision to move the trial to Madrid, as well as the change in the nature of the charges, but the Spanish Supreme Court ruled in favor of Madrid. The Provincial Court of Navarre argued that the bar fight between the, two defend between the defendants and the members of the Civil Guard did not amount to terrorism and insisted that the case should be handled locally. In addition, both the Regional Government of Navarre and the Count City Council of Chasu, ha they have rejected the terrorism charges of the, against the eight uh, young bass that, that, they are, that they are facing. Right? The Spanish National Court chose to override the appeals by the local authorities and charge the defendants uh, with offenses related to terrorism anyway. This has turned the case into one of national prominent prominence with massive media coverage accompanied by heated debate from all sides. In 2011, the Partido Popular, the PP, came to power with Mariano Rajoy at its head and has continued in power to the present day. The roots of that political party reach far back. Being formed out of a collection of right-wing and conservative parties, one of which was founded by the well, a well-known minister of Francisco Franco. In short, Rajoy's Partido Popular includes a strong contingent of the same right-wing elements who personally or whose parents personally backed the Franco dictatorship. This fact is not lost on Basque speakers. In his testimony at the trial, Oscar, the civil guard who suffered the fractur fractured ankle bone, stated he could only identify three of the alleged ass assailants, actually one of whom was not any anywhere near the bar. Uh, nonetheless, a total of eight people have been charged. The decision to charge them with terrorism along with the lengthy and for many disproportionate prison sentences recommended by the judge was publicly endorsed by the president of the Spanish government, Mariano Rajoy. The outcome of the trial will be decided by three judges and it's the presiding judge who gets to decide what evidence to admit. In this instance, the presiding judge is Concepcion Espejel, who is married to a high-ranking official of the Civil Guard. In the past, she has received awards of appreciation and merit from the, that institution. So far in the trial, requests have been denied which would have removed her, Espejel, for conflicts of interest. Also not admitted until quite recently has been a testimony by witnesses on behalf of the accused as well as video recordings and photographs that throw into question the official version of events. All of this is now under national and international limelight. The trial began last, last Monday. The eight young people on trial are from 19 to 24 age, years of age. The judge has recommended the following prison sentences, 62 years for Oyan. For six of the other young people, including Joaquin and Alur, 50 years each. And for Ainara, the second young woman in the group, 12 years. Here we have a scene from the court on the 16th uh, when it started. Uh, seated facing away from the camera are Oyan, Alur and Joaquin, three of the accused. They've been in jail without bond since November 2016. Each of them is housed in a se separately in a completely different prison. This is the response in Pamplona to the charges. This was on Saturday before the trial started. As you can see, the main square is absolutely jam-packed. This is the COVID demonstration, also in Pamplona, the group that argued that they should be accused of terrorism. More scenes from the 17th, the day after the trial started uh, in Alchazu, and another one. Parents of the accused also tra traveled to Brussels to make their children's plight heard in the European Union and they immediately received support from 51 members of the European Parliament from 15 countries who called for proportionality, justice, and equity for the defendants. 
Representatives of Amnesty International and other groups are attending the trial. The judge who originally brought the tra charges of terrorism against the Al Chasu 8 is Carmen Lamela, who I mentioned before. She's the same person who sent the elected leaders of Catalonia to jail, where they are waiting trial and being held also without bond. She also ordered the extradition of the president of Catalonia and four of his advisors, who are currently in exile in Germany, awaiting a decision from the German courts as to whether or not they'll be brought back for and be tried for treason in Spain. And these are some comments uh, recently from a journalist. By accusing these young people of participating in terrorist activities, the Spanish government is refueling a decades-old conflict that in recent years had started to settle quiet down. The memories of the civil guards, historic crimes against the Basque people, again, along with their collaboration with the Franco dictatorship that killed and tortured Basque nationalists, are still fresh in the minds of many, including the residents of Alchasu. The sentencing will take place in two days, on April 27th, 2018. Now we're going to change. We're going to go to another question, a question I asked in the beginning about what was hiding in that language. As I mentioned earlier, when I started out some 40 years ago, I wanted to find out for myself what would be, might be hiding in that language, Euskera, no, the language that no one ever bothered to mention, as well as in the beliefs of the people who spoke it. In what follows, you'll see that what I found was somewhat unexpected. And we'll find out that the best language and culture is probably not as isolated as some people might think. My own relationship to this particular aspect of the research dates back to the early 1980s when I began to learn Euskera. That was when I first was told in Basque by a Basque speaker, as if it were a secret, that the Basque used to believe they descended from bears. Since then, that uh, particular statement has been corroborated by others. I was intrigued by the possible implications of this statement. After years of research, it is now clear that the belief, far from being limited to the Basque region, reflects an archaic pan-European worldview that harkens back, ultimately, to a hunter-gatherer mentality. In brief, the research is focused on a pan-European phenomenon that includes the bear sun tail, whose protagonist is half human and half bear. This is because his mother was a human female and his father was a bear. The story goes that one, one day a young woman went walking into the woods and ran into a bear. In some versions, the bear was, it was a very handsome bear, and she goes off under her own volition. In other versions, he was a little bit more forceful and, and took, him, took her away with him. And she lives with the bear, and then after a while, they have a baby. Um, and it's a little baby boy, uh, a boy bear, a bear, boy bear human, I guess. Um, and then the, the tales go on and tell uh, more about what this young guy, bear guy, uh, does. All right. Uh, therefore, this figure functions as an intermediary, that is the, the son, as a kind of Jesus bear, according to one informant, and is a central component in this much earlier worldview grounded in the belief in Ursine ancestors. Moreover, not only are these tales found in Basque as well as in Indo-European languages, the bear's son has a name in Basque, and variants of that name are found in Indo-European languages, a linguistic signature that is a direct proxy for past context. While this motif present, represents one of the most widely disseminated European folk tales, until the belief that humans descended from bears was plugged into the interpretive frame of these tales and related performances, they were not viewed as particularly significant. Indeed, there is a performance counterpart to the story of the life, birth, and exploits of this character, given that in the Pyrenean region, the bear fest performances still incorporate elements taken from the plot of the bear son narrative, reenacting, for instance, the initial encounter between the mother and father and, it, and the, the subsequent birth of the, of the uh, young little bear um, in the bear cave. Here you see the vast taking region of the first century, and then you can see the Basque region in kind of in purple, and the, the Pyrenees, and we're going to go to the Pyrenees right now. Um, <coughs> these are the locations where the bear fests go on each year. The zone extends from the Basque-speaking region in the west to the Mediterranean in the east. 
These festivals continue to be performed each year while their origins are currently under intense investigation. Moreover, all across Europe in what were once remote mountain villages, similar, similar although somewhat less structurally complex performances have survived where the performance, performers dress up as bears. This is from February 2018. Uh, and the young man who's playing the role of the bear is Ma Matthew Torres. We have uh, part of our group works with these people. So, um, we got that picture from one of them. The belief in Ursine ancestors shows up in many forms and disguises, one of which is the aforementioned set of folktales. At first, I believe the bear fest celebrated each year in the Pyrenees, for example, in Arles sur Tec, were unique. Later on, Especially after the arrival of YouTube and the availability of cell phone cameras, evidence for the fact that people dress up as bears in villages all across Europe became overwhelming. Nonetheless, it's only been in recent years that the actual connections between the performance art and the folk tales have been recognized. Indeed, the role played by European popular performance art in the transmission of its archaic worldview has been a key factor in its survival, along with the folk tales that have been passed down orally from one generation to the next. And here we see some of the pictures. Now, almost all of these photographs come from around two, uh, 2012. They're, they're recent. And here are some from Southern Europe, from Greece, from Sardinia, from Bulgaria. And these are only a few. There are many more pictures. Uh, and here are some other recent examples of European bare human performers. Uh, the, the ones that have the red scarves, those are from Romania, and they dress up in what really look like real bears' costumes. I mean, like real bears. Uh, of course, in Romania, they still have bears, so. All right, the, uh, some of the pictures were taken from a book by uh, Charles Frejer, uh, who was a French photographer. And he's argued, without any knowledge of the research that we've been doing, that these contemporary performers reflect the figure of the bear son. You can see his photos uh, on the internet. He has them all up there uh, if you want to look at them, uh, because I'll tell you, some of them are, are pretty wild, <laughs> really wild. OK. Um, as a result of all this research, uh, we've got two documentary films in the, in the works, one of which is already done. Uh, it was filmed in 2018, um, and it's called Myth, Ritual, and Folklore, Reawakening Our relations, ration, Relationship to Nature. Obviously, if you think you descended from a bear, you're already inside nature to start out with, right? Uh, then there's a longer documentary, which was just finished in 2018, and it uh, recounts the uh, Ursine, relates and recounts the Ursine genealogy. Uh, the, the filmmakers went all around Europe filming bear fest performances and interviewing experts on bear ceremonialism. Should point out that bear ceremonialism is found in Siberia, it's still alive. It's, uh, you can find it in North America, uh, not too far from where we live. Uh, the uh, Native Americans have beliefs that are, that are similar. Bear ancestors, are, they're not unique. Um, now, uh, in the case of this documentary, um, they also, uh, well, they did things like uh, record the festivals, and at the same time, uh, the filmmakers uh, emphasized the Ursine genealogy that's embedded in them. The film was done by two Italian filmmakers, Andrea Ar Arena and Nicola I Imoli. Um, and it's being currently taken around to film festivals in Europe. Then, if anybody's interested, uh, you can find more information, uh, more articles, more pictures, and all the rest of it on my website uh, at academia.edu. And that's it. OK, the first question. Does Spain have a, co a constitution that protects freedom of speech and a court that protects this right? Um, it has a constitution. And uh, if you were to talk, uh, if you were to read the uh, Spanish language press, uh, the dominant press, you would say that they would probably say that they respect freedom of speech. Uh, there are people who might uh, question that, put it that way. I have one here, which is, where in the United States are the highest concentration of individuals from the Basque Country? I'd say um, 
Probably one of the places is uh, Nevada. A lot of bass sheep herders went there in like the beginning of the 20th century um, and did quite well and ended up taking over the casinos, right? So they own a lot of casinos. Uh, also around Bakersfield in California, there are French bass that are there, good-sized population. And also around Boise, Idaho, they have uh, day schools for children to learn Basque in, in Boise, run by some, some friends of mine who graduated from the University of Iowa. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. How many non-Basque speakers support the Basque cause? And what is Spain's case against the Basque independence? And what is behind the, uh, the oppression of the Basque people? Okay, let me take the first part. Uh, how many non-Basque speakers support the Basque cause? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the Basque cause is here uh, in, in the question. Uh, if it means that the Basque language uh, should be spoken, that it should be taught in school, I would say that the majority of the people living in the Basque country support that position. Um, and then... What is Spain's case against Basque independence? Again, I would, I would back up a little bit with that, with this question, and say that in the Basque country, the majority of the people do not favor independence. They've seen what happened in Catalonia. Um, they're pretty aware of what happens when you try to break free from uh, the Spanish state. There was an attempt some years ago to hold an informative uh, referendum in the Basque country, and that was squashed. I mean, the people that were involved in it were removed, let's put it that way, from, from their positions. Um, so again, right now, I personally don't think that there's much of a support for Basque independence in the Basque country, other than within some kind of wild-eyed <laughs> young people who think, oh yes, you know, we can be independent. Um, one of the arguments that is in, has been made in favor of independence, I think is, you'll find it as an interesting one, uh, it's been made by uh, people in business. And their complaint is that the Basque are very, very industrious people. They're, the Basque country is a very industrialized uh, country, high-tech robotics and stuff like that. Uh, and the complaint that the uh, Basque business community has, and I'm not saying the entire community, but there are elements in that community, uh, their complaint is they cannot deal directly uh, with Brussels. So they, you know, they have to go, like, go through Madrid and go through all the bureaucracy in Madrid rather than be able to, to make arrangements directly in Brussels. And so the Basque country set up w with the business community. They set up this kind of ad hoc entity inside Brussels to help support the, the Basque uh, business community. One other thing I just mentioned about the, the Basque community in, in terms of its uh, culture. Uh, the largest cooperative in the world is located in the Basque country. It is a huge cooperative. We're talking about billions of dollars per year. Uh, cooperativism is one of the features of the Basque culture. They are people that work very much together. Uh, and so you can imagine <laughs> these people, since they want to work together and they want to make money, I mean, they, that is also something they're interested in improving uh, their, their fate in that respect. Uh, they would like to have more direct vehicles, right, to to carry out business ventures. Uh, and so far, that's they haven't managed to do that. But they recognize that even if you were to get independence, what would that mean? All right, we've seen what what has happened in Catalonia. Not a, it's not a good scene. Okay. Um, okay. What what is the reasoning behind the oppression of the of the Basque people. You have to remember you have 40 years of, of Franco, uh, of the Franco regime. Uh, I gave the, I, I mentioned the anecdote of what happened when the young Basque recruits went to Burgos and they did their political service. That was told to me by a Basque recruit uh, in Burgos who was doing his service and he happened to end up living in the same place that I lived and he told me the stories. Uh, and that was in the late 1970s, early 80s. Uh, so you can, you can see what 
that it, that it continues to be fostered, right? If you read the media, you'll see that the reason that they're trying to make this charge uh, a charge of terrorism rather than just a bar fight uh, is because they're trying to link the, the, let me back up, the ETA, which was an armed movement, a very misguided armed movement, uh, it ended completely in 2011. The same day that this trial started, the ETA leaders who had have disbanded issued public statements about disarming, about the total and absolute disarming, that they, they, they were apologizing they were for everything that had happened. Now, an apology obviously isn't the best thing, but people died on both sides in, in that. And so here it is, the same day that you should be celebrating the fact that this armed group is completely and absolutely eliminated, you have a trial in Madrid trying to link these young people who can't even be identified as terrorists and somehow as being the prolongation of ETA. It's like they're trying to revive it. And this is not just me speaking. There are other peoples that have noticed this. This has not gone, gone unnoticed in Spain, that all of a sudden, you know, you, you've got this entity that you've been yelling about and, and screaming about for, for decades. They are, are gone. You might have to start talking about salaries and cutbacks in, in you know, retirement funds and all kinds of things like that uh, if you did not have this particular topic to keep talking about. So the trial is seen by many as sort of fulfilling this and also making many people question uh, what is really behind the trial? Okay, I don't know. I think that's it. Yep, two oh, more. two more. Oh, okay. On the uh, trivia sheet at your tables, one of the facts was only slightly more than fifty percent of Basques believe in God. What is significant about this fact in relation to Basque culture, history, and worldview or beliefs? <laughs> Interesting question. Okay. Um, I guess the question about whether you know 50% of us uh, don't you know don't believe in God. Um, I'm not sure what the statistic is for for Europe in general. I mean, if you went to Germany, I think it would be pretty similar. I mean, I don't think that this is is all that different. Uh, there's a very it's a very the Basque country is very secular. Um, people will go to church sometimes to get married. Uh, you know, token token kind of attendance at, at church. Um, how significant is that in relation to Basque culture, history, and World War? Wow. Um, I don't know how significant it is, uh, other than the fact that there is a very, very strong um, movement in the Basque country, uh, an environmental movement. They are, they are very, very much in love with their mountains and their rivers and their streams and their animals, uh, and they are constantly trying to protect them uh, and in that respect, I suppose there is a kind of love of nature that uh, is uh, somewhat different than somewhat different than the way in which nature is portrayed in, in some at least in some organized religions. So that that is maybe maybe a relationship between why not too many people believe in God, and, and uh, but they do believe in. In nature, and they believe in their, 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 I should put it this way, that there is a spirituality about them, uh, but it is much more spirituality that kind of looks at, at reality and looks at nature and is amazed by it uh, and realizes that there is something there, there's something more, um, but not necessarily exactly what one finds in an organized Christian religion. Okay. Okay, and then this. This will be the last question, if you want to read it in. OK. Um, what is being done to resuscitate the Basque language and uh, um, its use? All right. Uh, what you have is a constant effort. You have schools uh, where people can, where the students can uh, study in Basque. Uh, they can opt for everything in Basque, or partly in Basque, or pretty much everything in Spanish if they want to. Um, the, the way in which it's promoted, 
I think, is very much uh, at the level of those people that already speak it, uh, who try very, very hard to convince other people <laughs> that they should speak it, that it's important uh, to, to speak the language. Uh, you have newspapers that are in, in Bass, not very many, but they, they are there. Uh, you have a lot going on on the Internet where people create blogs, they write different things in Basque. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, musical mo uh, movement. I mean, there, there are every, everywhere you look, uh, there are people that are singing in Basque. They also have uh, contests, which are called Bersolari contests. I'll just mention briefly what these are, because this is also a way in which they are promoting uh, the language. Um, Bersolares are people who sing, right? But they sing poetry. And this is a traditional kind of uh, Basque uh, competition. Um, and it involves things like, they have like around 140 different melodies. Uh, and you can choose your melody. The melody will give you the, the rhyme, you know, kind of the, the scheme of uh, what you're going to be singing. And they hold these contests. They have like runoffs. You start at the very, very lowest level in the local communities, and then they have runoffs and playoffs, et cetera, et cetera, and then you go to the nationals, right? And at the nationals, you will have around 20 to 25,000 people in the audience. Uh, and you have your singers up on the stage. Uh, these tend to be young people, but uh, occasionally somebody's over 40. Uh, and then you have someone who gives them uh, a theme a topic. Uh, there are two of them, right? Uh, I mean, two people. And uh, the topic might be, uh, you're the employer of X company, and uh, the other one is, uh, is the employee, and he's just been told that they're going to cut, you know, cut, the, cut everybody out of the, you know, close the factory and take it to China. Uh, that could be a topic. And the person, the, the person who is giving the topics gives the topic then the person will give the rhyme scheme, I mean, the scheme that is supposed to be like saying, okay, do it in a sonnet. I mean, it would be more or less like that, right? The person, the first person has to start singing. And the person can't repeat anything. You can't even you know, repeat, you know, you can't have, you know, all the same rhyme, right? You, you lose points if you do that. So the first person starts singing. He stops. And it could be a sheet because women have won these contests too. Uh, and then the other person has to start right then, right, with the same melody, right, and respond, right? This is the debate, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Uh, in the national fi uh, finals, they have time limits. Uh, they didn't used to, years and years ago. Uh, they would do these in town squares, and I know of one that took place over six hours. <laughs> uh, the latest thing that's happened in that area is young parents, right, send their kids to Bersolari schools, you know, like the outside extracurricular activities go to a Bersolari class. And they have just started the junior league for Bersolari contests. So they are now, uh, they have the little kids, you know, yay big, uh, who are competing in grade school. <laughs> Uh, and in order to compete in this, you can imagine how, how good your Basque has to be. I mean, you must be really good uh, to be able to do this. And it's very prestigious, and the young people really, you know, they like the singers. Plus, many of the singers are also singers who make records, right? So you've got this kind of mixture of popular singer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, popular culture and your own language, and on and on and on. Um, there's one question which I did not get, I thought I was going to get, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, <laughs> I think we've got a minute or two. Um, one of the questions that I thought I would receive was something about what the, uh, what the word Euskalduna means, right? I use that over and over, right? Le tot. Well, let me back up. Uh, you all know the word Basque, right? But in the Basque language itself, the word Basque doesn't exist does not exist, all right? So if you say, as many people would say, uh, oh, I'm Basque, I grew up in the Basque country, my parents are Basque, I have Basque, you know, Basque last names, on and on, I'm back and back, right? Well, that's just fine, good, you're Basque, right? But you're not Ewa Skaluna. And this was only discovered by the people that were not Ewa Skaluna in the 1990s. They just didn't know it, it was like this secret that was kept. When I learned the language, 
what when I discovered what this was all about, I was I was going to classes. I was staying in a little hostel, in a tiny little village. And in order to improve my Basque, I would sit in the kitchen in the, in the evenings because the woman who ran the place uh, was also the cook. Uh, she owned it, and she was a cook. And they spoke Basque in the kitchen, so I'd be in the kitchen. And one evening, um, someone said, hey, uh, your son's coming. She was speaking of the, of the owner. And so she grabs me by the arm, takes me over to the, to the stairway, grabs me, right? And she says, this is my son, right? She addresses her son, and she says to her son in Basque, Roz is Euskalduna. <coughs> and I kind of went, I kind of sputtered, right? And I said, no, no, I'm from the United States. I'm from Iowa, right? And she looks at me, and she says, Euskalduna Sarasu, right? You are Euskalduna, right? Well, this made me, I said, what's going on, right? I then figured out later <laughs> uh, what this was all about. And this came from a lawyer that I, took me to lunch one day. Uh, when we were speaking in Basque, I was by that time fairly fluent in the language. And he says, you know, one thing non-Basque speakers don't get is they think that if they have Basque names, if they grew up in the Basque country, they have Basque blood, right? And they speak to me in Spanish, that I somehow identify with them. He said, they could be speaking to me in Hungarian. It wouldn't make any difference. They're equally distant. They're not Euskalduna. Right. All right. So, in other words, if you learn Basque, you become Euskalduna. You acquire an entirely new identity. And this is not a joke. It's real. Right. Um, this I was uh, telling uh, Mag Magit. I don't know if she is back there somewhere. Yep. I, uh, that uh, I've uh, taken students there. The people from the young people from the states who have gone to the Basque, country, and they just go, "Huh." So I learned Basque, and then they learn Basque, and then they suddenly realize that they are part of this community. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, you can be you know look Japanese, you can look Native American, you look whatever you know African, you know North African. Um, as long as you speak Basque, you are Euskalduna, and you are on the inside. In other words, it is an inclusive notion of identity. And I think that many times isn't projected. In fact, as I said, people did not know this. I mean, Basque speakers, people who spoke Spanish, right? They didn't know this until the 1990s. I was uh, with a friend, a couple of friends, uh, not, well, it was in the late 90s. Uh, or mid mid nineties, I should say, uh, and this was a young woman who had grown up speaking Spanish. Her father was a fluent Basque speaker. Her mother was a Spanish speaker, and we had gone out to have pizza. And I was sitting with a couple of other people uh, who were Basque, and we were speaking in Spanish. And somehow this topic came up. And I said, yeah, I said, I'm like, I was really impressed because I suddenly realized I'm Euskalduna. Um, and the young woman started crying. And I said, what's wrong? She said, my father never told me. She had spent all those years with him and had not realized. He could not say she was Euskalduna, and he saw her as kind of the other, uh, not in a bad way but it's the other. Now, this has also caused problems in the Basque country because Basques, right, Los Bascos, <laughs> those that consider themselves Basco, right, uh, have a hard time with the fact that they are not Euskalduna. And so they have been trying to redefine the word Euskalduna. Uh, not very successfully, though. OK, so I think that's it. Thank you. So thank you, Roz. This was a very interesting program. I also want to thank right now, uh, once more, our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, as well as today's special sponsors, Karen and Wallace Chapel and Midwest One Bank. Uh, also, thanks the City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. So now, for some fun, Roz, as a special token of our appreciation, 
we present you with a very coveted Iowa City Formulations Council mug. Okay, thank you. <laughs>